I keep thinking if I do a news episode, then afterwards I can sit back and relax knowing that I've caught up with everything that's going on in the world. And then I receive another 400,000 updates into my news feed and I realise it's time for another news. There's so many changes in the world of renewable energy, of energy storage, of electric vehicles of all shapes and sizes, of uh, smart grids, of hydrogen. Amazing. And of course, you know, the continuing war of attrition carried out by the fossil fuel industry to cling on to power for another few desperate years if they possibly can. So that was an introduction and this is Fully Charged News. Now, I'm being careful uh, on this news episode because I've been told that when I bang the desk, the noise is quite bad on the microphone. I apologise. And I do have a way of m rigging the microphone so that it's not resting on the desk. I'll get there eventually. It's a step-by-step -step process. Now, this probably won't come as a surprise to fully charged viewers, but uh, it is a simple fact that uh, uh, homes in the United States of America tend to use a little bit more energy than any other homes anywhere else on the planet. Now, some basic stats really highlight this. Now, these are slightly out of date. They're back from 2010. But if anything, uh, due to energy efficiency products and a, a, a greater awareness of energy efficiency in countries outside the United States to start with, uh, if anything, these figures will have reduced uh, but uh, the latest research is indicating that the American figures haven't. So it's very simple. Uh, in France, a typical household, uh, their annual power consumption is about 6,400 kilowatt hours a year. In the UK, it is around 4,600. Now, that difference is all to do with heating. Uh, France is much better at electric heating because they've got nuclear power. They've been doing it for a long time. Uh, in China, it's about 1,300. So Britain, 4,600 kilowatt hours a year. In China, 1,300 kilowatt hours a year. In the United States of America, typical household energy consumption over a year is 11,700 kilowatt hours. It is just mind-bogglingly more. But the, the big point of this research and this article that was recently in Electrek is that uh, the larger American ho homes, of which there are numerous amounts, oh, very, very wealthy people with massive homes, they are emitting 25% more uh, emissions than, than all the other, the more, the more modest homes in America. It's not like everyone lives in a massive mansion, but there's quite a lot of massive McMansions in America. In my personal experience from living there, you know, everything in America is kind of bigger, even the salads. The sandwiches, the, 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 the bucket of highly sugared fizzy drink, you know, just colossal amounts of stuff. And in my experience, the houses were bigger. The apartment that I used to live in in Los Angeles, the bedroom in that apartment was about the same footprint as my house here. It was pretty enormous. And of course, it had a massive air conditioning system on the roof that went 24 hours a day. So, you know, quite a lot of energy consumption there. You know, fridges are gargantuan in America. Washing machines are just massive. When you walk in, get your washing, walk out again, they're huge. All those appliances, air conditioning units are on an industrial scale. And they use way more energy than the similar appliances would use in uh, Europe. But there are moves, thankfully, now in the United States to reduce that consumption somewhat. In fact, it's a recent report has shown that house builders who are building new houses in America are making them slightly smaller than they used to. There's not this huge demand for a really massive house, which is not a bad idea. Because if you've got a massive house, it, it takes more energy to either keep it warm or cool, which is the two big challenges in America, depending where you live. Uh, there's a growing movement in America to get rid of uh, natural gas burners, boilers and things like that in new homes. And in San Francisco in particular, they are trying to ban it so that you cannot build a new house with natural gas because there now are alternatives. You don't have to burn gas. People are working out that smaller, more efficient appliances, LED lights, still haven't caught on in such a big way in America. There's going to be loads of you in America that will correct me and say, I've had LED lights for ages i know they exist but they're very very the standard the norm in this country and in europe they do save money and more and more people of course are fitting solar pv to their roof photovoltaics generate electricity particularly in a country that's very hot if you're in a hot part of america why do you want a lot of energy you want it in the middle of the day when your air conditioning's on so those sort of things really make sense sadly in some states existing energy companies are resisting the installation of solar panels and trying to make people pay for the electricity that they generate themselves by buying solar panels that is called a free market economy 
kind of confusing. The thing is, we can live in warm, comfortable, either cool or warm homes using way less energy than we use now. That is not, it, it, it's doable now. And we obviously need, if we're building new homes, that needs to be built into the home as it's built. Those are really important things. I predict this will be a massive business opportunity in the next 10 years. It's huge opportunity for American companies and European companies to make money as they install and develop uh, new technologies and don't try and cling on to the boring, dull, drill and burn technology. We've got to move on from that. We're soon going to go and see some new homes that have been built in the last couple of years where their overall carbon footprint is minuscule, their energy consumption is minute from the grid, they generate their own power, they heat themselves, they have ground source heating, they have energy storage in the homes, and these are affordable homes. It's basically the cheapest house you can possibly build. And we're going to go and see them soon, and that'll be on fully charged in the coming months. Anyway, moving on, because here is a report in a publication that I would not have believed was possible a mere five years ago. Now, the publication I'm talking about is called This Is Money. So it's a kind of, a, it's an offshoot of an existing British newspaper. And that particular newspaper is the Daily Mail, which is anything but a trendy, left-leaning, wishy-washy, liberal, eco uh, publication. It is an extremist right-wing, ultra-conservative, reactionary publication. But This Is Money, this uh, system publication, have reported, OK, only five years late, that electric vehicles are cheaper to run over their entire lifetime, taking in all considerations. Apparently, that's news. Who knew? OK, so I'll climb down off my high horse and my moral high ground and congratulate this is money for publishing this report. Here's a quote from the article. In 2020, the average lifetime running costs, including purchase price for an electric car, is £52,133, while an equivalent petrol model is 53625 Now, they don't say what a lifetime is, so I'm going to guess 10 years. And uh, I'm going to guess that they are uh, calculating that on uh, electricity that has been bought off the national grid at the current price. They're not using things like uh, off-peak charging of people who've got solar panels that charge their cars off that. All those other things that you can do to reduce the price. That said, still, with all that aside, it still shows that with the most expensive way you can buy an electric car and the most expensive electricity you can buy, they are still cheaper than burning fossils. They also point out that uh, the annual tax and maintenance cost, including MOTs, that's the annual British safety vehicle test, and servicing for electric vehicles is 49% lower. 49%, that's a lot <laughs> than petrol models. While refuelling costs are 58% less money. And they go on to say that electric vehicles, this is a really key point, electric vehicles hold their value better than petrol or diesel equivalents, with an analysis of auto traders' second-hand car data revealing that a year-old electric vehicle loses 12% of its, of its value when it was bought, compared to 24% uh, right down for petrol and diesel models. So that's great news. A big populist uh, newspaper, with a lot of people read it, you know, they, put, they, they finally put out some facts about the, the truth about electric vehicles. And then I made the error of reading the lower, uh, the comments on the, the you, know, you should never read the lower half of the internet, just don't look at it. But I did scan the comments and they were very, very typical of a, a Daily Mail readership, sadly. And I'm not going to go make any uh, snidey political comments about them, other than if you just read the comments and you hear those voices, they're, they're full of hatred, uh, fear. And, and, and some fairly, uh, you know, outrageous aggression. So those people who read that <laughs> article in This Is Money are certainly going to stick with diesels. I'll stick with diesels. Thank you very much. I am sick of having electric cars rammed down my throat. Just shows what size throat these gentlemen have. Massive. We know they're all men. I'm not going to say anything else. All I can say to all those comments is, <gasps> yawn. Read them all before. They're boring, dull and all wrong. Moving on to yet more about news about the cost of electric cars. Uh, they are getting cheaper. Mm, interesting. It's not quite as straightforward as a lot of people think. And I am not going to suggest that electric cars are going to get cheaper from the big uh, European brands or American brands that we know and love. Where the cheaper cars are going to come from is clearly China and uh, India in particular. We don't haven't reviewed a lot of Indian cars. We've done a couple in the past. They haven't really caught on in Europe. But this Tata Nexon... 
Very interesting car. It's got a 30 kilowatt hour battery, has a range of around 130 miles. It is a liquid cooled battery pack with an eight year warranty, which I think is very important. Over the air software updates, thank you very much. And the ability specifically to wade through very deep water because there's often bad flooding in India and then people want their vehicles to be able to go through deep water. This vehicle costs around $18,000 or £14,000 uh, uh, in UK or €15,500. It's not bad, is it, for a 30 kilowatt hour vehicle? If you think that the original Nissan Leaf was over £32,000 for a 24 kilowatt hour battery, this is now a 30 kilowatt. It's not a big battery pack, it's not a big range, but it's quite a cool car. And the fact that it's that much, and this is before any subsidies, if it was imported directly here and they charged the same amount of money, it would be £14,000 take off the British uh, car grant, it would be £10,500 for a brand new electric vehicle that will do around 130 miles. It's got CCS charging, it's got everything. Over the air updates, water cool batteries, wading. <laughs> now, India has truly, truly terrible air pollution problems in their cities. I've been there, I've breathed it. It is choking, your eyes run, you're coughing all the time, you're walking along the street. It is pretty, pretty bad. It's not just automotive traffic, it's also wood smoke, it's, it's industrial fumes, it is a bad, bad problem. But certainly cars add the, the underlying layer of ultra-toxicity to it. So they really need to develop this, and this car isn't going to be available to us in Europe or in the United States or Australia or New Zealand. But there are other smaller, cheaper Chinese uh, vehicles that are going to be available. And we'll shortly be running uh, an episode uh, made by our Shanghai correspondent. Over to you, Elliot Richards. So Elliot is, has just been to the uh, big motor show in China. He's got a lot of news about electric cars. And he's got a couple of reviews of electric cars that will be available in Europe uh, coming soon on Fully Charged. One of the cars he will see, no doubt, will be the Neo EC6, which is a very impressive looking it's another SUV. It's another big SUV. Okay, it's a big SUV. I'm not going to make any excuses for it. It's an SUV coupe. Not quite sure what that means, but it's got a hundred. This is the important point. It's got a hundred kilowatt hour battery. One hundred kilowatt hour battery, and a price that is hovering around the forty thousand pound mark. Now, forty thousand pounds. That's an expensive car. Forty-four thousand euros or fifty-one thousand dollars. I just want to point out that the only other cars that are available at, the, at present. This will change, but the only other cars you can buy at present with a 100 kilowatt hour battery, we're talking a, a range of over 300 miles easily when you have a 100 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, it's the top end Tesla Model S and the top end Tesla Model X, both of which start at around $96,000. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying this car is cheap. I'm just saying it is cheaper, cheaper. Now, Back to houses and energy efficiency and heat for a moment. Uh, there's a company in the UK that supplies a huge amount of uh, UK households with electricity and gas. They are called British Gas and they're doing a number of things that kind of indicate the general movement of, of industry, I think, of big companies, more than governments, of big companies, uh, particularly in this country. Uh, uh, so as, as their name suggests, you know, gas is a kind of a big part of what they do, or at least it was. But now they appear to be changing. For a while, they banged on about hydrogen being the future. But for using hydrogen in any way outside small passenger vehicles, I'm 100% behind. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant technology. There's a lot of problems with it, but they can be solved. But they were really banging on about hydrogen. Well, they've stopped. They've gone, yeah, hydrogen's going to happen, but it's going to be another 10 years. We need to do something now. This is British Gas saying we need to do something now. And they're starting to install heat pumps in houses and not gas boilers, which has been the absolute basis of their business. They are suggesting that in order for the UK to meet the 2050 net zero CO2 target, they need to start getting rid of gas boilers right now and install heat pumps. Pretty quick smart. Now this, I've just got to remind you, this is British Gas talking. I was sponsored by them. Fully Charged was sponsored by British Gas for a short period of time. The, engine, the people who work there are amazing. The engineers, unbelievable, really incredible people working for the company. It got a little bit awkward around the whole Centrica fracking thing. I got a bit moody. It was all a bit, oh, you know, oh. but let's move on. Water under the bridge, because what they're doing now is really, uh, and this is only half of the story, this is only part of the British gas transformation. They've just announced that they are buying 
listen to the number, 1,000 Vauxhall Vivaro pure electric vans for their engineers to go around the country fixing things. They're not trying out. They're not doing trials with six or 10 or 15. They're buying 1,000 now. And in the future, by 2030, they will not have any combustion vehicles in their company. They will all be electric. And we've recently heard about another electric van manufacturing company that are supplying 10,000 vans to a big distribution company in this country. And obviously, we've heard about Rivian and their 100,000 vans that they're supplying for Amazon. This stuff is going to change quicker, I predict. Quicker, faster, more profoundly than uh, private electric vehicles. That's going to be a slow growth. It's, it's growing. There's no question. It's getting faster and faster. We're going to see more and more electric vehicles on the road, more and more charging infrastructure. Where we're going to see the really big changes is in uh, the delivery system, which we're all using much more of. Those vans are not going to be diesel anymore. They're going to be electric much, much faster than anyone thinks. And penultimately, uh, as many of you will know, we ran the first fully charged live in the United States of America in Austin, Texas earlier this year. And many people have asked us at the time, why Austin and Texas? Why not in California? Um, you know, and it's gratifying to know now that we weren't totally crazy. The rumours have been flying around for a while, but it has now been confirmed. Tesla are building their next gigafactory in the United States in Austin, Texas. Of course, we knew they'd do that. We just knew it. We were just ahead of the curve. We haven't got a clue, really. But anyway, it's amazing news. I'm really pleased. Uh, at the moment, they're going to be building the Model Y there first by the end of 2021. They've only just cleared the site. It's just a flat bit of ground at the moment. They're going to build a factory and they'll be producing the Model Y by this a bit later, than a bit, bit more than a year. Pretty damn quick. Uh, they will also be building the uh, Tesla Cybertruck in this plant. Uh, so there we go. Yeah. And oh, while I remember, we're going to have a review of the Tesla Model Y coming to you very soon on Fully Charged. No, we haven't got one in this country. All will be revealed. Now, one last thing. I just think this is worth mentioning. Older drivers. Oh, yes, that's me. I'm an older driver. Yes, they will no doubt remember the Haynes Manual. Oh, yeah, I remember the Haynes Manual for my Morris Minor 1000. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> now, if you had an ice car, an internal combustion engine car, combustion car, in the 1960s, 70s or 80s, so still a lot of us are still knocking around from that era, uh, You will, and you m m looked after it, you maintained it yourself, you will no doubt have had a Haynes manual. It told you all the bits of the car and everything about your specific car. I had one for my Morris 1000 van. I was very proud of my Haynes manual. Well, now, I think this is really cool. Renewable UK... Uh, the Renewables Consulting Group and Siemens Energy have produced the Haynes Owner's Workshop Manual about electricity storage. There are links, you can download this, it's not that big. It's a very comprehensive guide to all the different technologies being developed around the world in this critical area. If we can store loads of electricity, we can be 100% renewable. There's no argument about it. All the arguments fall into uh, a big fossil-filled bucket. That's all. I just want to say a massive thank you. We could not do this show, particularly this year, without our wonderful Patreon supporters. We've had a whole load of new ones recently. I'm so grateful for you to continue supporting Fully Charged. It is, it is tear-inducing. It's amazing. So please listen to these list of brilliant names. I want to thank Mike Barrett, Brennan Dew, Tony Olshanksy, Jamie Easton-Wise, Anton Aneda, Gemma Charlton, Christine Burns, Rick Wilkinson, Martin Ford, Paul Veal, John Pettinger, Nicola Worthington, Mike Appagelati, Andrew Waldron, Rob Tungman, Bernie Murphy, Daniel Vogeds, Graham Shapcott, Nick Clark, and David Lewis. That is amazing. We're so grateful for your support. Uh, please do have a look at the Patreon page if you want to. No pressure at all. That's really, really appreciated. Um, do subscribe to Fully Charged. That really does help us. It doesn't cost anything. You just click subscribe and then you'll get all the episodes we do. You can click the little notification bell up in the top right-hand corner of this video. I bet it's at the top left-hand corner. Anyway, it's somewhere on the screen. Uh, there's YouTube membership, which we are growing as fast as we can. We're going to do more stuff for YouTube members in the near future. And that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching.